Hello and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to quickly uh, have physics revision for all the chapters. If you, um, if this helps you, do give it a like and comment. I have also made another video related to last minute physics revision, which is linked in the description below. Do check it out. It's going to really help you. So let's start. Um, quickly start with these uh, equations. Remember, speed is the scalar quantity, it's distance over time. The vector quantity for speed is velocity, which is displacement over time, okay? This S is not distance, it's displacement. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, which is velocity minus um, in final velocity minus initial velocity divided by time. Moving on, we can say resultant force equals to mass multiplied by acceleration. This equation can also be written like this because for weight is a force and then mass multiplied by g. G is the gravitational field strength. It can also be written, it also means acceleration of free fall, basically the acceleration experienced by an object when it's falling under the force of gravity. This is G. G equals to weight over mass. And then we have uh, some equations for density. Density equals to mass divided by volume. Um, F equals to Kx. This is the Hooke's law. I will write that here. The equation is force equals to K, which is the force constant, multiplied by extension, the change in the length of the spring when force is applied. That is ex extension. And then you have a two equations for pressure. Pressure equals to force over area. The unit for pressure is pascals. When you have a liquid pressure, you have to say density, uh, gravitational field strength multiplied by height. As the height increases, that means if you have an object which is submerged gr greater in uh, the liquid, it's going to experience a greater pressure. Um, the surface area does not matter, okay? Only the height matters. So both of them have same pressure if um, the liquid is same. Because if the liquid is different, for example, if you have oil and water, they will have different uh, different uh, density, right? So the density changes, the, the pressure will change as well. Sometimes in question, you have to equate both of them to find the unknown value as well. Moving on, we have some more uh, definition equations. Uh, this is work. Work done equals to force applied multiplied with the distance the object move. Power of work has, has the SI unit for joules. Power has the SI unit for watts. Power is basically work done per time. And then power, work done and energy transferred are same, are same. So we can either write work done or energy transferred. And then we have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy equals to half mv squared mass times velocity squared. Uh, potential energy equals to mgh. In some cases, you can say uh, kinetic energy equals to potential energy. If, the, if these are same, then we can equate them so mgh equals to half mv squared now you can cancel the masses and you can find any unknown quantity even if you don't have the mass then we have efficiency the ratio between the useful and the total power energy or work done basically power out over power in or it's also the energy output over energy in the energy taken in or is the output of work done over the input of work done and then you have to multiply this by 100 to get the efficiency because you the unit is in percentage then you have moment of force multiplied by the perpendicular distance because if you have an object with a pivot this force is applied like this then you need to know the perpendicular distance between them okay not the parallel distance Okay, I remember that the object is in equilibrium when there is no resultant force or no resultant moment. So at that time, if there is no resultant moment, clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. Any 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 force that is causing the object to move clockwise is the clockwise moment, and any forces that is causing the object to move anti-clockwise is called the anti-clockwise moment. So um, clock, this is the clockwise moment. This is the anti-clockwise moment. Sometimes you can even have multiple moments on one side. For example, here you have one moment plus another moment. You can be equals to f three d three. So for, for something like this, it would be you will have f one here and d1 and then you will also have f2 and then d2 right and then the on the other side anti-clockwise moment it, it says it has f3 and d3 that means it's the f3 is on the other side okay so it basically depends on your example you have to see which um, forces are acting in which direction then you have a uh, momentum momentum is the quantity of motion it says mass multiplied by velocity 
And then a change in momentum, delta P, is the impulse, force multiplied by time. This is the impulse. Force times time. Change in momentum is mv minus mu because momentum is mass times velocity, right? Mass multiplied by final velocity minus mass multiplied by initial velocity. Now let's move on to thermal physics. This is Boyle's law. Here temperature is constant, remember. P1 V1 equals to P2 V2, used to find the unknown uh, value. And then specific, uh, this is an, a for specific heat capacity. C is the specific heat capacity. Q equals to MC delta theta. Q is the energy transferred, taken energy taken in or energy given out. Multiply by the mass, C is specific heat capacity. And then a change in a temperature. Q can also be written as delta E. Both of them are same. If you want to convert Kelvin into Celsius, subtract 273.15 from Kelvin. And then if you want to uh, uh, find Kelvin, you just move this over there and add it to Celsius. Moving on, let's move on to the chapter of waves. Velocity equals to frequency times wavelength. And then frequency equals to 1 over time period. Frequency is the number of comp number of waves produced in one second. And then t is a time period. That means the time taken to, comp to, um, to have one complete wave. Remember, one complete wave has a crest and a trough. Then we have n, which is re refractive index, the ratio of speed of wave into a different region, which is sine i over sine r. And then I also found this equation somewhere, n equals to c over v, c uh, refractive index equals to speed of light in, in vacuum, which is 3 times 10 power, c is 3 multiplied by 10 power 8 meter per second, and, and then uh, v is the speed of light in the material, whether it's whether it's um, air or some other medium medium and then n equals 1 over sine c so, uh, c is the critical angle okay then there these are some quantities that may help you what is ultrasound ultrasound is sound with a frequency greater than 20 kilohertz speed of sound in air is 300 to 350 meter per second in water is almost 1400 meter per second and steel is almost 6000 meter per second and then i also saw that concrete has as the speed of sound in concrete is 5000 meter per second this is very important audible sound frequency is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz or 20 hertz to 20000 hertz speed of light in vacuum is 3 multiplied by 10 to the power of 8 meter per second take care of the units okay Next, let's move on to these. These are some helpful notes. These are discussed in detail in the other video. We also discussed graph in the other video, so please do check them out for last minute revision. What happens? There is a reflection of waves. Remember, reflection is in the same medium. The medium does not change. The so speed, frequency, and wavelength remain the same. It's only the direction that changes, right? Incident and then a reflected wave. The direction changes. Then you have diffraction when it's moving um, through a gap. The shape changes. Remember, the, the shape changes, right? The speed, frequency, and wavelength is again same because there is no change in medium, in the medium of the of the wave. In refraction, the speed changes, frequency remains same, but the wavelength is uh, changing as well. If lambda, if frequency remains same, will if a uh, velocity increase in velocity will increase wavelength, a, redu a reduction in wavelength is going to reduce velocity. Then these are some rules of us for the what happens in lenses. When light rays pass it through a lens, what happens? If your object is beyond 2f, the object is real, smaller, inverted, but the image is going to be closer to lens. If the object is uh, between f and 2f, the image is real, it's bigger, inverted, but further away from the lens. If it's exactly on 2f, the image will be real, the size would be same, it will be inverted, but it would be equal distance to the lens as the object. If the object is between lens and f, the image will not be real, it will be a virtual image, it will be larger in size, and um, the object will not be inverted, it will be upright, uh, same as the object, and uh, the image location would be behind the lens, Okay, not, uh, for, uh, not beyond the lens, and this is used in magnifying glasses because the object is bigger, right? Now let's move on to electricity and magnetism. Remember, I is current equals to charge over time. So electric current is basically the charge passing a point per unit time. I has the unit for of amperes. Q has the unit for coulombs. Then V equals to IR. That's Ohm's law. 
And then we say that the voltage is constant that shows that uh, current and resistance are inversely proportional to each other. And so on. Now we have some equations for power. Remember, power equals to current multiplied by voltage. Here in the second equation, they just removed this V and replaced IR, so you get I squared R. You can also um, replace, uh, replace the current. You can also write this like this. You can replace the current as, remember, current equals to V over R, right? So you can write this as V squared divided by R squared multiplied by R, and then you can cancel both R's. This r and this square, so you'll get v square over r. Another way to write the equation for power. But you don't have to memorize this. Even if you just know this equation and this equation, you will be able to solve without knowing these two equations. So I will just erase this. Then work equals to power multiplied by time because power is basically work done per unit time, remember? So you can also write it like this. <coughs> I'll remove this to make it easier to remember. On the other side, you have two equations for EMF and potential difference. That basically, the electric work done to move a unit uh, to move unit charge. If you're moving that unit charge around the whole circuit, you're getting EMF. If you're just moving it through a component, for example, a resistor or a voltmeter, that's called the potential difference. The formula is same, but the symbol is different. EMF ha uh, has a symbol for E, which is work done per charge, and a potential difference has the symbol of E, of V, which is work done per charge. Again, the symbol is same. Then you have something called kilowatt hour. As the name suggests, it's kilowatts, the power in kilowatts, I will write k watts, multiplied by time in hours. This is basically used to calculate the cost of using your electrical appliances. Then you have resistances, calculating resistance. If it's series, you just to find the total resistance, you just have to add. But for parallel, it's slightly different. Remember, if you have only two resistors that are in parallel and you need to find the total resistance, you can use this formula. R1 into R2 divided by R1 plus R2. But if you have more than two resistors, you have to use this one. 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus R2 plus R3 and so on. You can even use this equation if you have two, okay? This is the general one. And then when you find find it, you, you have to reverse it to get RT because this is 1 over RT. Don't confuse that, okay? So for example, if you get 1 over RT equals to, let's say, 15. So RT is basically 1 divided by 15, okay? Make sure that you convert it so that you get the, the total resistance, not the reciprocal of um, total resistance. And on the other hand side, you have this equation. Resistance is directly proportional to the length of the wire that you have and inversely proportional to area. You might also know this equation. The, you can remove the symbol of proportionality and write R and then write resistivity multiplied by length over area. This is a constant which is different for every every uh, sub every material. This is the cross-sectional area of wire. The formula for that is pi d squared divided by 4. Then uh, you have transformers, right? So our transformers, remember, the voltage in secondary divided by voltage in primary equals to the number of turns in secondary over number of turns in primary. You can use this to find the unknown value. If you have current, voltage in secondary divided by voltage in primary equals to the current in secondary over current in primary. Then let's move on to nuclear physics. So you basically have alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, right? So this is, these are shown in this example. When you have an alpha radiation, you get alpha particle. This alpha particle is basically helium nucleus. What happens here is that the, um, A minus 4, the mass number reduces by 4, and the proton number reduces by 2. Look at this example, 238 minus 4 and 92 minus 2. The, the change is shown here, 4 and 2. A helium particle, a helium nucleus is basically an alpha particle. Then you have beta radiation. Um, the mass remains same, but the proton number increases by one. And then you get a beta. This beta particle, this beta is basically an electron. It has zero charge. Uh, it, sorry, it has zero mass. And then the charge is it has negative one. Okay, because it is only electron, no proton. You can see in this example, two thirty four remains same. And then you add the proton number ninety plus one. And then you get an electron. On, in gamma radiation, there is no change in mass because gamma is not a particle. Gamma is an electromagnetic radiation. 
Then you also have the concept of half-life. Half-life of, of an isotope is basically the time taken for half of the nuclei, nuclei of that isotope in any sample to decay. Let's have a look at this example. Let's say you have a radioactive substance of 400 grams. It has a half-life of 20 minutes. And then after some time, you see that this has reduced to 50 grams. They're asking you to calculate how many half-lives have passed, okay? So initially, that means at time zero, it was 400 grams. After one half life, that means the time at 20 minutes have passed, right? After 20 minutes, this substance is going to be half. So it's going to be 400 divided by 2. It's going to be 200 grams. After another half life, that means plus more 20 minutes. That would be 40 minutes. It has reduced to half again. So it's now 100 grams. And then after another half life, this was second. This was third half life. Uh, it has reduced to 50 because 100 divided by 2 is 50 and then time is 40 plus 20 it's 60 minutes so that means after 60 minutes you will be left with 50 grams life after three half lives you will get 50 grams now let's move on to space physics these are two important formulas that you need to know v is here the average orbital speed the speed to move around the entire orbit the formula is 2 pi r r is the average orbital radius the radius of the orbit divided by t orbital period the time taken to travel the entire orbit v equals 2 pi r divided by t on the other side you have d by v equals to 1 over h naught um, what is d d is the distance of of the galaxy from earth from any galaxy that you're measuring uh to, from earth v is the speed at which the galaxy is moving away from earth this is v and h naught is the hubble's constant at uh, the value for hubble's constant is 2.2 .2 times 10 power negative 18 per second this equation represents the age of universe and it provides us evidence that all of the matter in the universe was initially a single point and it's moving away from us then i uh, remember this unit this uh, quantity one light here is 9.5 multiplied by 10 power 15 meters that's important and that's all 